What I'd like to do now is to explore the essence of beta. In the last video clip, we went through the basics of the capital asset pricing model. And the beta was derived, the beta representing the ratio of the covariance of a particular security or portfolio with a well-diversified broad portfolio, which we sometimes refer to as the market portfolio. Now, what we did in the last clip was to argue that the risk of the security is not the standard deviation, is not the variance of the security. The risk of the security is how that particular security contributes to the variance of the portfolio. So the beta is kind of a short measure of that contribution. It's a standardized measure in that we standardize by dividing by the variance of the well-diversified portfolio. So it's a ratio of contribution to average contribution. So the covariance is divided by the variance of the well-diversified portfolio. Now, how do we actually get the beta? Now, uh, there's a number of uh, firms that provide beta services. Um, if you look at, for example, value lines, um, uh, analysis of each uh, security, you'll see in the top right-hand corner um, the beta of the security. Now, how is the beta actually obtained? Well, you actually know what the formula is for beta. It's the covariance of the security with the well-diversified portfolio divided by the variance of the well-diversified portfolio. It turns out that that formula is the formula for a slope coefficient in the linear regression. So the usual way of estimating beta is to regress the excess return on security J on the excess return on security, um, uh, which is the market portfolio. Okay, just consider it uh, one return. So it's a linear regression. The linear regression produces an intercept and it produces a slope coefficient. The slope coefficient is the beta. And by definition, uh, in linear regression, the slope coefficient exactly equals the covariance of security J with this well-diversified portfolio divided by the variance of the well-diversified portfolio. And this is sometimes called a linear factor model, sometimes called a linear regression, sometimes called the market model. No matter what you call it, we get a beta. Now, while we're on uh, names, sometimes the beta is called the beta, the risk exposure, the risk sensitivity, or the factor loading. Sometimes people say the loading is. It doesn't matter. All represent the same thing, and that is the relative contribution of Security J to the well-diversified portfolio. Now let's talk about the mechanics of actually estimating the beta. Say it's a regression of Security J on this well-diversified portfolio. Well, um, two questions arise immediately. First, how many months do we use in our regression? Or how many days? And what is the well-diversified market portfolio? Now let me tell you traditionally how people have uh, approached the beta. Traditionally, people take monthly data and usually look at uh, about 60 months or five years of data. And analysis within the U.S. would take um, the excess return, let's say, on IBM, and regress 60 months of returns on 60 months of returns uh, on the, the market uh, portfolio, which might be the S&P 500 or a broader portfolio of all NYSC and Amex and NASDAQ stocks. And this delivers a beta. And the beta for IBM is maybe 0.8. So IBM is less risky than the market as a whole. And maybe that's the reason it's called a blue chip um, company, a blue, blue chip stock, which usually means beta less than one. Now, um, question. 
why do we use monthly data when we've got daily data? Well, for IBM, it's not that big of a deal, but for some other stocks, they're sometimes subject to infrequent trading. This means that not every day does the stock trade. And on top of that, it might trade during the day, but maybe early in the day. And a lot could happen in the market by the end of the day. So think about the following scenario. The stock is not that frequently trading, but it trades on, let's say, this one day Monday, and it goes up by maybe 1%. And at the same time um, that this stock is trading, and let's say it trades, in, the last trade is at 11 o'clock in the morning. At the same time, the market was up uh, about uh, 1% also. However, later in the day, the market plummets by 5%. So the overall return on the market that day is minus 4%. But this stock is plus 1%. Now the next day, the market uh, goes up by 1%. And our security, it adjusts to this drop of um, of 5% that it missed in the previous day and then it also goes up by 1% with the market. So what happens is that you get a minus return of 3% that day. So what I'm painting is a scenario of the stock moving very similarly to the market except it's not trading all the time. So the first day, we've got a 1% return on the stock, but a minus 4% return on the, uh, the market. The next day, we've got a minus 3% return on our stock, mainly because it's catching up for the previous day, and a plus 1% uh, uh, return on the market. Now you can imagine doing a regression with this data and what's going to happen. It looks like these two um, things are moving in opposite directions. It looks like um, when the market's up, this stock's down. When the market's down, this stock's up. You're going to get a negative beta or a very low beta, which is very misleading. So part of the reason that we look at longer horizons, like a monthly analysis, is to avoid this problem of infrequent trading. Now it turns out I should say as an aside, in the investment course we go through some techniques whereby you can adjust the beta for the presence of infrequent trading. And actually in the lecture note you'll see a simple adjustment whereby the regression is augmented by instead of regressing the stock return J in excess of the treasury bill on the market, you regress the stock return at time T on the market at time T and then also add the market at time t minus 1. And roughly speaking, you simply add up the beta coefficients that you get to get the overall beta. And this is a, a standard adjustment for in, infrequent trading. However, for monthly data, it's really not a problem because firms trade uh, almost always uh, during the month. Nevertheless, the standard practice is to use monthly data. And the standard practice is also to use about five years of data to calculate a beta. Now, why five years? I don't know. It's a convention. Why is the convention there? Well, because people perceive betas as changing through time. 